Yes. Uh, let, let him get those cameras moved around here as soon as he gets set up over there. Um, we're going to have a, a word, a testimony this morning. And I want you to go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 10 if you got your Bibles. Romans chapter 10. Frank, if you want to make your way up here, I don't fall over. Just stand there and. Hmm? Um, that one's crooked a little bit. You're gonna you're gonna have to probably come around and look at it. Okay. You have to get in the camera. Um, and then get that. Those of you that don't know me, my name is Frank. Uh, came to this church back when Greg came back to Fairmont, which was 08. 08, yeah, so about 10 years ago. And used to cut the grass here. So one time, yeah, it got a little rainy and, and got behind. I had a company that, you know, we cut grass. So, showed up here, all ready to do our thing. And Greg's in the back, had him about two thirds done, and I got offended. That was stupid on my part. Um, I want to apologize to you again. And here it is, you know, 10 years later, I finally got smart and came back. Okay, first day I came back, I tithed for the first time in a long time. I had my house for sale. So I came in here, I tied through the first time in a long time. A couple of days later, I got an offer on my house. And after you know, some back and forth on it, I accepted it. And here, uh, kept tithing. I found another house that's more suitable to my needs. And I was the first one to see it. It hadn't even really hit the market yet. So, you know, by coming in here and doing what we're supposed to do, you know, give God back the money that is actually his, I've done what I've been trying to do for several months. You know, I'll just came together. Then after that, you, know, you and I and Hollywood were out to, for lunch and uh, some things came together on that too. Uh, I'm downsizing so I have furniture that I'm looking to pass along, you know, sell if I can, give it if I can, whatever. I have some other equipment for you know my business that you know I'm looking to uh, pass along too, and you know ended up coming to a deal with on an extension ladder that he needed and I had extra, so yeah things are just <clears throat> coming together, and I just want to thank God for that. Yes. Just want to praise him for that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, God's moving, and sometimes we don't share, and um, and so these things that God is doing in our lives just get unnoticed. Where you know the Bible's clear on testifying, um, praise reports, whatever you want to call them, and so um, God is faithful. Thank you for sharing that. Romans chapter 10. Let's look at <clears throat> verse 1. 
And before we get there to verse 1, I want to, I was, I want to lay a little quick foundation. We've been talking in our midweek classes. You can find them on Facebook. You can find them on Periscope. You can find them on YouTube. You can find them on our website where they're not hard to find. We make them available everywhere on the Internet that we can, our midweek and our Sunday morning. But we've been talking about the two trees and something, and we're not going to talk about that today, but we're talking about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And I want to just start off with this. It's not what we're going to talk about, but I want to start off with it because I can't remember what I say here and what I say there. And I know they're going to bleed back and forth, and, uh, but I want, to, I want to say something in preparation for this message this morning. It's part two of last week's message, Positioning Ourselves, was the title. The tree of life, and let's just say this is the garden. We don't really know how big the garden was, but it was a garden, and it had an entrance, and we know it had an entrance because God, after the fall, put guard, guardian angels there, or cherubim or whatever, with flaming swords so Adam and Eve could not get back in. So here's the garden, and here's the world. Okay, garden could be a type of the kingdom of God and the world being the world. But anyway, they had the tree of life. They were eating of all the trees, the tree of life, except God said, don't eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. We told you, and you ought to know by now, that represents the law. This represents Jesus. This represents religion. This represents life. I'm not going to get into all that. Just kind of giving you that again. What I want you to see is these people, Adam and Eve, were perfectly righteous. There was no sin. There was nothing. They were perfect, and they had everything they needed in this garden. They did not need to go outside the garden, into the world, out there. They don't even know what's out there. They've never been out of the garden. In other words, they've never been out of West Virginia to go anywhere else in the world. They got everything right here. Really, what do we need to leave the state of West Virginia? You, don't need to leave. you really don't need to leave the state, but we do to visit. We do to go sightseeing. And, but the garden was like that. There's no need to leave. Everything we have is here. You understand that, right? And they're perfect. They are righteous in God's eyes. Put that there. They were righteous. And as long as they're eating from this tree, they're experiencing life. They're experiencing blessing. And he told them, if you eat from this tree, you're going to get cursed. And you're going to die. And what else happens? They get kicked out of the garden. Now they're out here in darkness. Not actual darkness, but, you know, they're not in the glory realm anymore. No glory. They're out here in darkness and... <clears throat> Now, here's what I want you to see. As soon as they ate from this tree, it took them out of the blessing. They experienced the curse and came as long as they tried to do things themselves. And that's what that means. Trying to do something yourself by a list of do's and don'ts, whether it's the Ten Commandments or anything like that. This, this, this is all about rules and regulations, do's and don'ts. And this is about promise. As long as they ate from this tree, everything was great. They had everything. They ate from this tree, they get kicked out. They're in the world, and now they've got to fend for themselves. How? By learning good to do and evil to avoid. But what happens is they do evil, they do good. It's just like constantly good's with evil. Right, right where they do good, evil's right there. And he calls that sin, falling short of the glory of God in Romans chapter 3. So they're out here in the world. And they are now out of the realm of blessing. They're out of the realm of, have, of righteousness because now they're no longer righteous. They're sinners after they ate from this tree. Now we've developed this. I'm not going to go any further, but I want you to see this. They're out in darkness. Now, the whole purpose of the cross, and as I've said before, and we just, we just started, God showed me this about two weeks ago, in the garden were two trees. But God gave us a third tree called the cross. Jesus dies on that cross so that we can be redeemed and restored back to what they lost, which was a state of righteousness. That makes sense? 
And now the cross brings us back to the tree of life as, as dark and bleak as the cross is. Remember the electric chair. As bad as that is, God turns something horrible into the tree of life. So I look at it as there's three trees. And the third tree being the cross brings us back to the tree of life. And so I say the cross is the tree of life. And therefore, we're back in the kingdom of God, the garden. And this is where we live again. He takes us out of the world. What's Colossians says? We've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So what the tree took us, this tree took us out, this tree brings us back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now let's read this. Romans chapter um, 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God or to God is for Israel. And um, because you have to understand why he's talking about Israel. Because all of Romans, he's talking about the church. And the people are thinking, well, he saved the church. What, what about Israel now? And he says, my heart's desire is that they be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Most of the church has a zeal for God, but they try to live for God through this tree of knowledge and good and evil. It's not according to knowledge. They have a fire for God. They have a zeal for God. they got a passion for God. But the foundation is wrong. It's based on law. And they're constantly under lack, curse, can't get things going. They're producing Ishmael's left and right. They're going into the tent, which we talked about, and like Abraham did with Hagar, and produces an Ishmael. And God says, that's not the blessing. That's not by promise. You did that by works of the law. Okay? Verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. So they're still trying to, Israel, even Israel today, is trying to establish their own righteousness by works of the law, Ten Commandments plus. There's 600 laws in the Old Testament. For they became ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God, which is now by faith. I become righteous by receiving Jesus into my life. Not by works of the law, but by faith in Him. Verse 4. For Christ is the end of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Christ is the end of the law. Is that what it says? For righteousness. So I can't become righteous by eating from this tree. This tree made me a sinner. So i got to come back over here and operate in faith, not works. And I become righteous through the gift of faith. The, um, for Moses writes about the righteousness which is the law. And he talks about the man who does these things shall live by them. And so we're not going to be living by the law. That's what brings the curse. That's what got them out. We want to get back in. And it's through faith. It's through the righteousness that's imputed to us now through faith. Verse 6. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from, from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. What he's saying in verse 6 and 7 is you... you, you it's simply faith in Christ. You can't go up there and bring him down. You can't go down there and bring him in. Where is he at? He's in, he's in faith. And where is faith at? It's in the word of your mouth. Verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And this is how you get saved. This is how you get saved. That if you believe in your heart... That God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. So believing makes you righteous, not by what you do, do, or don't do. But believing makes you righteous. For with the mouth, or the word of God is in your mouth, in your heart. Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confesses, confession is made unto salvation. Now, this is not where I'm going. Here's what I want you to see. For the, verse 11, for the scriptures say, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Whoever believes in Jesus will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction, verse 12, between Jew and Gentile, Jew or Greek. Here's what I want you to see. 
For the same Lord over all is rich to us, or rich to all, who call upon his name. Now, you're going to have to fix the periscope because you, you're, I, I'm not even on the screen. Just move it a little bit. See, he's not on You got the board there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Thursday night when we were teaching, as I was preparing this week, that of last week or this past week for Thursday night, I never saw this in verse 12 before. And it says, who is rich to all who believe. I want you to really think about this. What does this mean to you? Now, all we set up to this point is you can't get saved by the law. Everything we just read there, let me just sum it to this. You can't get saved by obeying the Ten Commandments. Christ is the end of that law. He now is, Christ replaces the law, faith has to be put in Him, and automatically you're made righteous. And for faith in Jesus, believing alone, makes you righteous, and He becomes rich to you. Now I remember in 07, you know, we, we talk about tithing and we talk about giving and you've got a lot of crazy, cr crazy messages out there about giving. And, and, I, and I had heard all sides. And, you know, because I didn't get a revelation myself, I'm like, well, that sounds good. I'll, you know, and I had my belief system in, in, that er in the area of giving. But I remember coming home one night in 07. And I came into my house, and I walked into the living room. And I wasn't even praying. I wasn't seeking God. I wasn't doing anything. I was just coming home from somewhere. House was empty. Everybody was gone. And I came in there, and all of a sudden, God says to me, you're rich. You are rich. And I had studied pros the prosperity message, preached on prosperity, did all that. And I'm like... Okay, and boom, I got it. I, I, it would take me probably four hours to teach it, and you know that I can. I can start right now and be here at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But I got four hours of revelation in one second. I just got it. It's the craziest thing. I'm like, oh, my God, I get it. So I'm not going to teach that. That's not what I'm talking about today. I want you to be aware of some things that, you know, just keep that in mind. We'll, we will develop this down the road when God opens the door to speak on um, prosperity and giving and things like that. But I just want you to see, this is just not about money. This is, he becomes rich to you. Were these people rich in this garden? They had needed nothing. Yeah. Now, what is your definition of rich? Is it a million dollars? Or that you have need of nothing. Hmm? You got to define what what success is. We got to find what riches is. But these people had need of nothing, and God provided everything because God was rich toward Adam and Eve. But when they come out here, they got to they got to now work out by the sweat of their brow. Now keep that in mind. Go to Ephesians chapter one. I'm just giving you scriptures because wait till you see where we're going to go today. Ephesians chapter 1. I don't think I've ever preached this message in this church. I think we did in other places, but uh, this, this will be the first for some of you. Ephesians chapter 1. Now look at verse 18. 1, 18. Well, let's start at verse 17. 1, 17. That, God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom, spirit of revelation, in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding, that's the scales falling off of our eyes, every time we open up the word, every time we get into the word, and God gives us revelation, scales fall off. We see him clear, faith arises, and we begin to walk out what he did. So that's why Paul said, this is probably the most important prayer you can pray. Pray it daily. Pray it as often as you can. That God would open the eyes of your understanding. Why? Verse 18. That you may know. 
You have to know this. That you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the hope of his calling, and what are the what? Riches. Riches of the glory of his inheritance. In where? The saints. The saints that's you. You got to know. Let me, let me see what the Amplified says. Give me a second to get to the Amplified of that. I'm curious. May, it may say it better. It may not. But let me look here. Verse 18, chapter 1. The Amplified. By having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know and understand the hope to which, you was, which he has called you and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints those that are set apart, the set apart ones. So you have to, if you don't know how rich you are, how are you going to walk it out? We've used this example a million times. <clears throat> if a drunk under the bridge, Third Street Bridge, if there's a drunk under there somewhere and he has a rich uncle somewhere and dies, there's a period of time that dude is rich and doesn't know it. It depends on how long the lawyer can... Number one, find out where he's at and then go under the bridge and get him. But in that period of time, he's rich and doesn't know it. He's living on Wild Irish Rose, Night Train. Those are all really cheap, brought gut, 2020, you know, under there. Bumming money off of people and the lawyer can't find him and he's filthy rich. Because why? Why? He doesn't know. And, and you know, this is Paul says, you don't understand the inheritance you have. And you've got to know it so you can receive it. Walk it out. All right, does that make sense? Now go to Ephesians chapter 3. And look at verse... 20. Now to him, God, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. That's, let me read that one in the Amplified. Now I know that's a good one in the Amplified. 320, let me get there. Three twenty. Now to him who by in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within you is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, our highest desires, our highest thoughts, hopes and dreams, God's able to do even more. You are limited in your desires as you sit here right now. You're not. See, the problem is you're not limited in your checkbook. That's what the world has you focusing on. But God says that's just the fruit. Your desire. You don't have the right desires. You've got to get your desires higher. And however high you can get them, he's able to do even more than that. Dreams. Go ask the average person, what's your dream? I don't have any. <laughs> what do you mean you don't? People don't dream anymore. They think that's left for kids. Or if they do have one, it was one they had when they were younger and they gave up on it. But ask the average person, honestly. Do, do a litmus test. Ask somebody in your family. Ask your, we can't ask your spouse because they're going to know now. Ask somebody that's not here. Hey, what's your, what's your desires? What's your dreams? What's your hopes? You'll see it is so common and so e it's, it, it's, it's reduced to what they can do. See, it's really not a dream if you can fulfill it somehow by engineering and orchestrating a ways and means. God gave Abraham a promise he could not do on his own. And that was become a father of many nations because his wife was barren. 
So the only way that woman's womb could be opened up was a miracle. So let me tell you, whatever your dreams are, if there is a way, because how many said, how many would do this? Well, I have a dream, but I need this to happen and that to happen. And if a guy would come up, yeah, well, that's, how about a dream that the only way it's going to happen is for a miracle? And that's when God, that's when you know you've tapped into God because you've tapped into the miraculous. I've got things he's told me that he wants to do. There is no way in the world I can do these things. I'm, I'd be like Moses sitting in front of the Red Sea. Well, he told me to go over, but I can't. Can I split the, can I go from east to west through the Monongahela? I'll be there forever because it's impossible to get across the river without a bridge. I would be there forever. I'm not going to swim it. But the Red Sea, this is, this, if your mentality is, hey God, that's, you know, that thing you promised me, you might as well just put me in front of the Red Sea. Because it's going to take that kind, hey, then you know you've tapped into God. It says here, he's able to do above and beyond what you can ask or think. Why are we limiting our thoughts, our desires, our dreams? Now, I don't, I'm not telling you to come up with your own because our flesh can come up, you know, if you really, if my flesh can dream, man, I, 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 I want a lot. No, <clears throat> we're going to get to that here in a minute. Because this has got to be balanced. Otherwise, I'm going to let make you leave here thinking you can have whatever you want. There, it's in the context of what God is saying and doing that he's purposed before the foundation of the world in your life. Now, Got that foundation? Now here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. I've never heard this message preached but once. Not going to hear this anywhere else. Deuteronomy chapter 11 is right there in black and white and it's the law. It's part of the law that they love to preach. <clears throat> you ready? Verse 10. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. Let's put that on here. Egypt is a type of the world. The promised land is their inheritance, which is a type of our spiritual inheritance. And he took them out of Egypt into the land of Canaan. Okay? Now watch. He says, the land which you are going to possess is not like the land of Egypt. So the world is this land of Canaan. Now, do you understand Canaan is the type of inheritance? You understand that, right? He said, Canaan is nothing like Egypt. You can't go to Canaan and operate like you operated in Egypt. What I would say is you can't get saved, get into the kingdom, and operate the kingdom like people operate in the world. Are you hearing me? He doesn't operate. We got a whole, the world operates out of the law. If not the Ten Commandments, they have their own laws. Do, do this, don't do this, four steps, five secrets, two keys. Even the world has self-help programs. It's got nothing to do with God and the Bible. Okay? So there's a way the world operates, and it's through the knowledge of good and evil. All right? And there's a way that Canaan operates. It's by promise. And you can't live in Canaan the way you lived in Egypt. That's what he's saying here. Watch. For the land which you go in to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come from where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. What? You've got to understand this. Let me read it again. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot like a garden. What does that mean? 
What happens in, in, with farmers when there's a drought? There's no rain that comes down. They got to get water somehow to their crops. Well, in Egypt, they had problems. There would be famines, and they had these gardens. They, this is the farmers. They grew their crops, and they had what they did, and they, they had an irrigation system that funneled from the the river Nile, and they would get their water from the Nile. They went right down the Nile, is, I believe, if I remember right, goes right down Egypt, and they got their water. And but how do you get the water from the river? Clear to where your farm is. Well, let's look at this again. You sowed your seed. You watered it by what? From which you have come. You had to sit there. That sounds like a born thing, right? And pump. That sounds like a born thing. A what? It sounds like a born thing. Uh huh. And you got to sit there and pump the water. So you just sit here and just. You're making water go from the Nile to your garden by work, self-effort. You're sitting there pumping. God says, when you go to this land, you're not going to have to water it by foot. Verse 11, but the land which you cross over to possess, it's a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of where? Heaven. Verse 12, a land for which the Lord your God cares. Who's going to care for this land? In Egypt, you had to care for the land. You had to get the irrigation. You had to get the pumps. You had to work the pumps. When you're tired, your wife worked the pumps. When she's tired, your kids work the pump. we got to get water. He says, I'm going to care for this. Verse 11, but the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills. Verse 12, a land for which the Lord your God cares. He, the eyes of the Lord your God, what? are always on the land. You ever wonder when it comes to your finances and you're like, you got to be the one to take responsibility for them? And you're like, God, you know, I, 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 up, to, up to the 15th, I was able to pay my bills. You saw. But from the 15th on, I need, now I need your eyes on it. And he's like, my eyes have always been on it. I told you that the the land that I'm bringing in you, in you into, which is the land of Jesus, the land of promise, inheritance, it's a land my father's, father says, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to always provide for you. Remember he said, look at the birds of the air. They're not out there sowing. They're not out there worrying about money. They're not out there worrying about their needs. He said, yet my father takes care of them. Is that what he said? He said, seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and what? All these things will be added unto you because the eyes of the Lord are on the land always. A land for which the Lord your God cares, verse 12. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year or the beginning of the month to the end of the month. But in this case, it says the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Your God is going to care for this land that he is bringing us into. So when you get saved, God is bringing you into new life, right? We're new creations. He's bringing us into the kingdom, back into the garden, if you will, into the kingdom. And his eyes are always on your life from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And you're not going to have to use self-effort and willpower. Look at, look, look at Luke. Go to Luke chapter 9. And keep a finger there, as I will. We'll get back to Deuteronomy. I want you to look at Luke chapter 9. And look at verse... 23. Jesus, we already saw this. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What does that mean to take up your cross daily? That means you don't have to sit there and pump anymore with self-effort and willpower. 
You don't have to figure things out. Is the birds figuring anything out? The birds don't even have an intellect. The birds don't even know how to pump. They don't know how to sew. They don't even know how to get all. Just, they're just out there, and every day God provides a worm somewhere. If we, have, if, we, if we would understand that, man, every single day God makes provision for us. Now, I know, I don't know about you, but I know we're in the month-to-month -month thing, you know, um, paycheck to paycheck. And we have to get this mentality that God's not asking us to take care of our land. He said, my eyes are on your land. My eyes are on you from the beginning of the year, beginning of the month, to the end of the month, to the end of the year. I will provide all your needs, Philippians chapter 4. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. So you don't have to find ways to get the river to your garden or how to get money in your house or in your checkbook. You do what God calls you to do. Wherever, wherever you're working, whatever you're doing... You do what you do, but you have to ultimately see he provides everything. All things. Now, now watch this scripture. Go to 2 Well, I don't have time. In 2 Chronicles chapter 19, God told Jehoshaphat, the battle is not yours. He had all this army coming against him. And he's sitting there thinking, okay, I've got to get weapons. I've got to get more men. I'm outnumbered. I got to get tanks. I got to get aircraft. Of course, he did. I'm just trying to give you a, a modern day understanding of this. And God's like, whoa, wait a minute. The battle is not yours. Why are you sweating this? See, Jehoshaphat wanted to get the pump out. Try to figure out a ways and means to win this army, win this battle. And God says, the battle is not yours. Fear not. Fret not. Don't freak out. It's not your battle. Because the eyes of the Lord are on you. Right? Moses, talk about the Red Sea. He said, stand and see the salvation of your God. Put those two scriptures together. The battle's not yours. It's God. So stand and you'll see the salvation of God in whatever situation you're in. Whether it's finances health, healing, um, you, uh, deliverance, whatever it is that's coming against you, stand and watch God move. Why? His eyes are on the inheritance, the land, the kingdom that you are now in. All right? God works for those who wait for him. Remember that scripture we talked about in Isaiah 64? God works while you wait. While you stand, he works. But we, we won't stand long enough to see him work. We want to get the pump out. We want to start pumping. Because God's, you know, you ever heard the saying, man, you're as, I could say that to my son this morning. Dude, you are as late as Moses. <laughs> right? How many have heard that? Yeah. Moses is always late. Why? Where does that come from? Where did that, where does that come? I got that from my, I heard that from my family. They never even went to church. <laughs> they've never read the Bible. Where do they, where do they know, where do they know about Moses being late? They just say it because they heard it. But where does that come from? Because he's up on the mountain, right? 40 days and 40 nights. And they're like, we don't know what happened to him. He could have fallen, busted his head, and has a concussion. He's dead. I'm not going out there. I'm not going, well, you know what? This, and they even said, this Moses, we don't know. And he just delivered them out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. Got, they saw all the miracle hand of God working in several ways. And they can't wait for Moses to come off the hill to, for instruction to do the next thing. So what do they do? They build the golden calf. They go back to the ways of the world. Because they can't wait for God to move. See, I can't wait for God to move. I got to do something. You got to do something. And when we step in and start pumping, we never, you ever, we'll never see the supernatural if we keep relying on the, on the natural. See, the pump speaks of the natural. And when you see the promise in Deuteronomy 11, that speaks of the supernatural. The rain comes from heaven, speaking supernatural. He says, you in Egypt got the water from the natural. 
I mean, and I, I don't know how many times I'm going to tell you this, and whether you believe it or not, some again, these scales have got to get off our eyes. You are not making a living. That, if you think your primary reason for being here on earth is your job, you've got some major scales over your eyes. Because if you think that's your primary reason for existence, then that's what you're going to be locked into financially. Let's say you have a minimum wage job, and you think that's why you're here on earth is whatever job it is, then you're going to get locked into that wage and that finance because you don't have a clue why you're even here. Right. And we must never forget, it. we're on our cross. Yeah. It was because of reaping choice, I believe, after the resurrection. Good and evil knowledge. We, we God, God knew it. He knew what mm -hmm. would happen with him being invisible and going away to prepare a place. Right. He knew what would happen because he perfectly understands evil knowledge. It's his job. It's to assume his job from birth. So because he perfectly understands evil knowledge from birth, repeat choice puts us on our cross. So if we have great patience, we can see partial mm -hmm. what it should be. Yeah. And, it, and it's all about having our eyes open to, to what he's doing. Now, um, go with me back to Deuteronomy and let's finish those verses Deuteronomy 11 and we left off at 12 a land for which the Lord your God cares the eyes of the Lord your God are always on this land from the beginning to the end of the year now verse 13 says and it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments which I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then, now verse 13, understand you have to read that under the understanding that this is the old covenant, which was a covenant of works. But you've now got to read this through the covenant of the tree of life, which is the new covenant, which is a covenant of faith. So you can take all of that verse 13 out of there and put faith. Because we've just showed you that in the New Testament that it's all about faith that you become rich toward God. Remember Romans 10? Faith toward God makes you rich. So 13, just put faith there. Now let's drop to 14. Then I will give you the rain for your land in its season. Now you've got to circle that word season because this is where you're... Remember I asked you... How many of you are experiencing the above and beyond what God can do for you? Or are you just experiencing what your wage is giving you? I don't know about you. There's not en My wage is not enough for me to live on. And I think that is designed by God to keep me in faith. He will wear me out in the flesh till I finally put an end to this and say, I give up. But again, that's something you've got to work out. But watch, then I will give you the rain for you, the land in its season. Now that word season, this is all about season. Those rains didn't come every single day. They came in seasons. That's why you read the Old Testament, there's a former rain and a latter rain. Those are seasonal rains that come from heaven. So there may be times that that... That, that you think God's not providing and you got to go a week, you got to go a day, you got to go, you, you, you know, things may get tough, but you got to understand this is all seasonal. For instance, where you're at, well, my dreams aren't fulfilled yet. That doesn't mean that they're not going to get fulfilled. You're, it's a timing and season of God. This is what really disrupts us. And I think the faith teachers have a little bit of guilt to take, the blame to take for this, is that whatever God's de declared for you to have, let's say God gives you a dream. Right away, you know the worst thing to do is try to go out there and make that dream happen. How many have got a desire, got a dream, and brought the pump out and started working to try to get that thing to happen? And it didn't happen, and you got frustrated. You thought you were acting in faith. You did what the Bible said. You obeyed. You did this. You brought the pump out. You worked. You, you waited for God to reward you for all your effort, for your ingenuity. And guess what? 
No rain. So you're like, well, I must have missed God. Well, forget it, I'm out of here. And we get mad. You understand, every dream, every desire has a season that it comes about. And because you're not walking in it right now doesn't mean it's a bad truth or you don't have enough faith maybe or whatever. You have to understand season, which we, we may have talked about that. But let me read on. The early rain and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Not just to have enough. He said you're going to get filled. Verse 16, take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. You could even say in that verse that take heed that you go another way, and that your focus of faith is on, on, on something else other than God, on other things, like the golden calf, for instance. They thought that was going to be their Savior now that Moses disappeared somewhere on that mountain. All right? So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? How does this, see, if you come over here, the focus has to be Jesus, the Word. Jesus is the Word. The object of your faith has to be the cross, okay? The power source, when, your object, when the object of faith is the cross, then the Holy Spirit brings the riches into your life and results are victory, life, fruit, or you can put in there the will of God, success, whatever. <coughs> Inheritance. Put inheritance there. The only way you're going to get your inheritance is to stay focused on Jesus. Why does the object of faith have to be the cross? Because going back to Luke 9, you have to deny yourself the pumping mechanism. And take up his cross, which is what he did, and it's a finished work. You can't add anything to what Jesus did on the cross. You now are eating from this tree, the tree of life, which, which you're righteous, so that right away, there's nothing to earn or work for. You're righteous. Now all you have to do is receive your inheritance. So let me tell you what to do. We go back to Ephesians chapter 3. All right? So what I would do, what I want to encourage you to do, because that verse is powerful, Ephesians 3 verse 20, is go to the Lord. And say, God, I know my dreams and my visions are limited to my IQ. My dreams and visions are limited to my how much money I make. My dreams and visions are limited to geographically where I live. And if you if you keep your dreams and your desires capped to whatever your wage is, wherever you live, and whatever your IQ is, and whatever your talent is, this is where you're going to live. Well, Jesus said, be it done according to your faith. I really believe that there are certain things in our life, and let's just, let me just sidebar this. Let me just give you something. There's a, um, it's really hard to distinguish between man's responsibility and the sovereignty of God. Luther had that problem with Erasmus. Calvin had that problem with Arminius. Um, Whitfield had the problem with John, with Wesley. One was one preached nothing but human responsibility. And if you don't do your part, God won't do His part. And they preached that to severity. Then the other side was, well, you you don't got to do anything at all. Don't even believe. Don't even go to church. Don't even do nothing. You just go about your business. Your name's on the roll call. You're in heaven. Go ahead, and God will do everything for you apart from you. And that's that's the other side that's wrong. He wants you to hear him, step out in faith, and there's a middle ground there that it's hard, and I give it to you, it's hard to, to balance between human responsibility and God's sovereignty. It is a juggling act for all preachers and people like you when you're trying to figure this stuff out. But I always lean toward God's sovereignty more than human responsibility because all you hear is human responsibility. And you never put it on, you know, God's doing all this. And he uses you to do it. 
So, you, so there is that coming together of both of them somehow. It's a mystery, I grant you. So what I'm saying is I believe that there are certain things God's decreed in your life that are going to happen regardless of what you do because you're one of his. You're the elect. However, I also believe that there's aspects of your life that you're not going to walk in because you didn't pray the prayer of the eyes to be open so you could see him walk in. You stayed stupid. <laughs> Honestly. Spiritually stupid. Not that I'm not insulting your intelligence. I'm saying spiritually. Why? How many times do you think he says in the Bible, know this, know this, that you may know? Do you not know? Do not be ignorant, brother. On and on, we hear that from Paul. And then the prayer was that God would open the eyes of your understanding so you can see how rich he is towards you so you can get out from under the Third Street Bridge, go sign your name somewhere, and live out your inheritance from your rich daddy who is in heaven. All right? Now the problem is, and it's a problem, define rich. Well, let's forget money. We'll get to that. Rich in health. Rich in mindset. Let me tell you what's not rich. A person who is depressed all the time. That's not God being rich toward them. Because depression is not a God. Depression comes from this tree. Depression is a curse. Joy, unspeakable, full of glory, is the fruit of the Spirit. And that comes from the tree of life. And that's a blessing. And that's freely given to you. So why is it that Christians are depressed and not joyful? And they're on pills, Prozac, and everything else, and not living in the blessing of joy. They don't know. What makes a person depressed? I, I think it's because they look inward to everything that's not, that maybe they want is not there. Yeah. I, I, I would say that's probably the biggest, is that I'm looking at my life, and I'm not, I'm not driving the vehicle I want to drive. I'm not living in the house I want to live in. I'm not living in the neighborhood. I'm not making the money I want to live. And so we get, well, you know, you can add to that depression. Depression, discouragement, disappointment. How many, how, how, who lives within that? There was a time, and I'm trying to get out of it. That's my regular fruit. Depression, discouragement, disappointment, frustration, I'm tired. Wait, this is not the fruit of this tree. Yes. I have an answer. Also, oh no, I, I don't disagree with her. And I, I'm agreeing with every word you say. Mm -hmm. I know you, you're a great teacher. But my answer to what, why is people depressed is, uh, there is, I think there is no perfect answer. But no, there's a variety of answers. Yeah. Right. But um, I think it's because... We, we forever in this world lose track of where we come from, what, where we come from into the fallen world mm -hmm. without practice of surrendrance from birth, which <coughs> it becomes extremely complicated because we get taught, well, God helps them, those who help themselves. Well, right in a, to, in a way, but those who help their self is exactly what evil knowledge is. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you, they're eating from the tree. Yeah, knowledge of good and evil. So, yeah, we're born that way. Mm -hmm. And we can't escape it totally, but with great, like you said, with great patience, we can see uh, yeah. something. Yeah. It, it until we make it through our cross by the one who conquered death, mm -hmm. Christ. Yeah. So, in, under, in in bringing this together, in closing here, um, I only got a few minutes left. So give me a few minutes to wrap this this up. I want you to think. He, you got saved. Romans ten. You got saved, and it says, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep harping on this. In Romans 10, verse 12, you got saved 
so he can be rich toward you. And I'm going to ask the question, do you feel that he's rich towards you? Again, going to Ephesians 3.20, are you experiencing the above and beyond what you can ask or think? Or are you locked into lack, disappointment, and limitation? That is, that's not what he came. That's what the world does by giving you a minimum wage is to lock you in. The world says um, you don't have a high IQ, so you can't have these jobs. You live on the wrong side of the track, so you can't be part of our social club. The world is always limiting you. Well, when you got saved, do you really think he let you stay within that realm of limitation? Now, I can't tell you when your season's going to come. You know... And I told him that this probably like, might be able to relate this message to what he said. But understand that from what his own testimony, Frank's own testimony was, he was gone for 10 years. Now, I don't know this, but it sounds like from what you said, you didn't go nowhere else. Okay, so he didn't go no, to no other church for 10 years. Okay, now, he didn't read a book and said, hey, you want to sell your house? <clears throat> Get into church, give the pastor some money, and you'll sell your house. And he's like, oh my God, I didn't know that. I'll do that. Thank you very much, book. I'm glad I spent $20 on you. That's not what happened. But that's what the faith teachers will write a book and tell you now, if you want whatever you want, go to church, because that makes God happy. Give money, that makes God happy, and he'll do you a solid. That's not what happened. What happened was the Spirit of God came on him, Tree of Life spoke to him, and said, I want you to, I want to open your eyes to riches, to blessing. I want to do something in your life. And led him, and what he did was obeyed what he heard. Not what he read. He didn't obey a formula. He didn't obey a principle. He obeyed the Spirit. And when you obey the Spirit, that's acting in faith. Because you're walking out of grace at that point. This is all about grace. So you've got to start hearing Him. I, I, this is not going to happen by osmosis. God speaks to us. Today, if you hear His voice, it says several times in Hebrews... Today, you want, you want your finances to change? Don't look for something to do. Seek something to hear. Hear what he's saying to you. It's not always going to be so, 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 so money. And this is, I'm not saying that can't happen. Because then I start limiting God and saying, well, the only God does. No, God can do anything. He can tell you to chop a tree down and then money comes in. Wow, that sounds pretty stupid, doesn't it? Would you do it? If you woke up this morning because God says, see that tree? Yeah, cut it down and, I'll, and, and you're going to see a breakthrough. So that's, how, how many, does that sound stupid? Jesus did it. Jesus standing there looking at this blind guy going, okay, God, what do you want me to do? I want you to spit. What? Just spit in the ground. Lord, he's wanting me to lay hands on him. I'm not going to spit on the ground. What's, there's no medicinal purposes in my saliva. God says, spit, spit on the ground. Fine. So the guy's thinking Jesus is going to go, be healed! Huh? No, he goes, Tch. God says, spit again. Make some mud. So he, you don't make mud with one spit. So you've got to put some flesh and blood on this. He's sitting there, Tch. Now we, we know he's lost his mind. Yeah. Just lay hands on me, dude. That's all I need. I mean, that one guy just said, speak the word, my servant will heal. Can you do that? Can you not speak the word? Why spit? And he's just sitting there for five minutes spitting, and God says, now make mud out of that. What? Make mud out of that. All right, God. Father, all right. And he puts his finger with his spit in that dirt, and he creates mud. Now what? Stick it in the guy's eyes. 
I don't want your spit in my eyes. How many really are willing to step out on what you hear to see the miraculous? Because that's the only way God moves. I'm telling you, he doesn't move by formulas or he doesn't move by some windfall. One day my money will come in. No, your money will come in because you will obey something he says to you. I'm just telling you. And it's not always sowing a seed, although I, would, I, I, I believe it. I believe that giving, Luke chapter 6 stands there all day long looking at you. Give and it will be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, and I'll cause men to give into your bosom. Do you believe that? Do you believe God can cause men to give to you? Favor? To get a promotion to get more money? Yeah. But you have to sow a seed, and the seed's not money, always money. It's sowing in obeying what you hear today if you hear. And really, it's not even obey. I look at this. God gives me a promise. For instance, Abraham, I'm going to open your wife's womb. But what does he got to do to get a baby? He's got to have sex with her. That's, she's not going to get pregnant on her own. I've had God have me do stupid things. Not a lot, thank God, because I ain't the type to go do crazy things. But I've had to do them. And God broke through. And you remember me telling you about the this business that I drove. This is this is in 20, this is 2003. And this little little daycare business opened up in a stupid, ugly little gas station, an old gas station over in Broadway in Clarksburg. And I and the, my first thought was, it ain't gonna make it. You got Mother Goose over there, another fort that's just killing it, right? And I'm like, they, they, they ain't going to make it. It's a, I mean, the, you could have picked the worst building? Come on. It, it was a gas station, a little gas station. So I just felt sorry for him. I'm like, well, whatever. I ain't going to make it. And um, so I kept driving by looking over there and looking at it, you know. And um, so we go down to <clears throat> Louisiana. I know you heard this story, but it fits this message. We go to Louisiana to a conference, me and me and two other guys. And um, I don't know, I don't know if it was where it was, Baton Rouge, maybe outside of Baton Rouge. What's the other big city um, where they have the uh, Mardi Gras? New Orleans. New or it was New Orleans. So we were down there in New Orleans because we because we had to drive to, to Jimmy Swaggart's just to check him out. But anyway, wanted to look at his facility. But anyway, so we're in New Orleans, and um, and I wake up with about six o'clock in the morning and we weren't supposed to get up to about eight and I'm like oh man so I just rolled back over and I'm half in half out and I see a vision of me walking into that stupid daycare and praying prosperity over it the blessing and I'm and that of course that wakes me up fully and I'm like I ain't doing that he says, I'm shy. I know you don't believe it, but when I'm around strangers, I don't talk. I, I just keep to myself. I don't do a lot of talking unless I'm around friends, and then you can't shut me up. But, or if I'm around Hollywood, I don't get a words in edgewise. But other than that, I, you know. So I'm like, I ain't doing that. Now, this was November of 2003. And we come back home, and I'm like, I'm not going in there and praying for those people. Randy had a situation, maybe share that sometime, of, of the other day when you, God told you to pray in front of these leaders at the Board of Education, the superintendent, the whole, everybody was their principals, every, right? I mean, was, and she's sitting in the back and God says, pray. And it's like, oh, I'm not, I'm like, man, that's courage. Um, so, I mean, she, in front of elect, some, you know, an elected official, I mean, now you're into politics. She's, you know, and, but I'm not going to go in there and do that. So every time I drove by that place, it haunted me. It just, it just kept speaking to me and making me feel bad. Not in a bad way, just, you know, and I think of it like, remember the Pee Wee Herman, big, the big adventure, when he goes into that 
that um, this is how I, in my mind thinks. When he goes in to save all those animals, the, 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 the animal place was on fire. And he's okay to save them all except those snakes. And every time he walked by those snakes, he'd go, mm, he just kept walking by the snakes, saving it. I, those, that, that building was those snakes to me. And finally, he just had to go grab those snakes, and he comes out there all over him, and he passes out on the sidewalk, but he saved it. That was me. I'm driving, and one day, January, almost two months have passed me driving by that place. And the car just went in there. I'm like, do it. Get it over with. Get the hell out so you can get off my back, and I can end this thing. Because I don't want to do this. That's the... It's like, Jesus, I don't want to spit in that mud and stick in that guy's eyes. So I did it. Of course, the woman's on the phone, so i got to stand there and wait ten minutes. And the other lady's like, she thinks I'm an upset dad over something probably because I want to see the owner. And um, so she comes out, and I'm like, okay, I know you don't know me, and this is going to sound strange. And I had this dream and a vision in, in Louisiana. <laughs> have to... You know, I live in Clarksburg, and I have to come here. I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pray prosperity over this business. And I said, I promise you, you will never see me again. No. I'm going to get out of here. Now, this isn't a blessing to me. This is to bless somebody else, right? She said, hold on. She gets the whole staff. We get in this. She makes a big, you know, I'm just want to get in and get out. And she wants to make a big production. <coughs> Shuts everything down, gets everybody together holding hands, and we just start praying. I do. I get the prayer in, I get it over with, I go to let go, I look over, she's bawling her eyes out. I'm like, all right. And I, she says, thank you. And I'm like, well, all right, I'm out of here. <clears throat> and I never went back. So that'd be 2003. So we got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eight years goes by, and she needs more room. So she moves across the street. She's, now she's got two buildings. Then that fills up. And then she's got to go to the... And build a building. So she's so I'm saying, man, this is crazy. And the people that, that I was running with at the time, they knew about it and they saw it happening too. They're like, man, this woman's business is really succeeding and prospering. And, um, and now they're building a big building. So I'm standing here and I'm sharing this in 2011 and your nephew is sitting where my dad's sitting right now and he's just can't wait to the end of the service to get up there and say you're not going to believe this but the building that I'm working on is that lady you're talking about because she told me about a guy years ago that came in there and prayed a prosperity and this is the result of God blessing us he goes she wants you to come back she wants to talk to you and I didn't go because that was all I was supposed to do. No more, no less. I don't want her given to me. I don't want her put me on a pedestal. I didn't even want to go in the first place. So don't put me on no pedestal. <laughs> you were like Pee Wee Herman snakes. I didn't even want to get in there. What am I saying? God moves by speaking, you don't you won't know an instruction until you hear him say what it is. You he's not going to come down here anymore, like Jesus did, and he do it, and we get to sit there and watch. No, he did come back in us, and we got to do whatever he tells us to do. I could tell you the story about me getting my birthday money and God knows I needed it and I went around the park and God said give all your birthday money to that, that, those two couple right there struggling because they were putting phone books in bags in 80 degree weather sweating like crazy just trying to make a living. And they're going to give out phone books. And I went around that park three times fighting that. That's my birthday money, God. He said give it to them. I'm like, you know how awkward that is to walk up to someone? I don't, I don't, can I tell you? Well, Greg, you can get up in front of a bunch of people and speak. Yeah? But, I, you know, I would rather get up in front of 2,000 people and speak than go to two people and talk to them about God. That's hard to do. I don't know them. 
I'm not a conversationalist. Some people, that's easy. That's why I'm not a salesman. I can't just go talk to people. I'm, I'm, I'm just not wired that way. But I had to do that. And we can go on and on things God's told me to do. Not all the time, but I'm ready to hear what he tells me to do. And here's what I want to end with this. So you start seeking God. Saying, God, you know, what do you want? What, 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 what are you speaking to me? What are you doing? Not what you want me to do, because that almost, you got it backwards. What are you doing? And this is what I tell people. When you get a dream and you get a vision or you get a word, commit it to God. Don't get in the flesh and try to make it happen. Commit it to God and watch him open up avenues, open up doors. You know, and then when you hear the, hear his word, and he says, go, go. Don't wait, go. Well, what if I'm wrong? I would rather be wrong. And I have been wrong. And I've, I've done something crazy that we'll talk about down the road. But we were sitting here, and I told you this, what, was it two weeks ago? It wasn't last... And worship was, I had five minutes left before I was going to come up here. And God gives me a vision of this girl. I don't know her. I know, I know her. I don't know her name. Um, I don't even know what she looks like. I know of her. But I haven't heard her name, hadn't seen her since 07. And I'm sitting there and God shows me a picture of some girl. I don't know who it is. And boom, he tells me who it is. Not by name because I don't know her name. But I'm like, oh. I'm like, why are you showing me her? Who's her? Somebody who murdered their husband who's in prison right now wants me to write her about the cross. I'm like, I don't even, and then I remember I know somebody who knows her mom. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about it. Then I go and tell a friend of mine who doesn't go to church here. He goes to our Thursday night <coughs> meetings. I tell him about it. He goes, oh my God, I know her. I grew up with her. And I'm like, all right, God. Got some confirmation going here. I don't have the address. That person knew the address, knew exactly where they were. Sent it to him. And we'll see what God's going to do there. That may not go anywhere. And then it may go somewhere. But how are things going to move if we don't move? How are we going to see the supernatural if we don't get out there and risk looking stupid? Risk trying to obey what you think you heard. Quit worrying about whether you... So what? So let's say I missed it on this prison inmate. Let's say I missed it on her. All right. What's next? I'm not going to quit stepping out because I know if I don't, nothing's ever going to happen. In your life or in other people's lives, if we don't step out and hear him. And I'm not going to try to make something happen with that letter by pumping. Uh -uh. My, I said, as far as I'm concerned, my hands are off and I'm done with this girl. That's it. I write the letter, I'm done. Now, whatever God does out of that, then again, that's opportunity for her or me or for him to move. But <clears throat> if I don't hear nothing, guess what? I'm not going to get out that pump and try to make something happen. I acted, I stepped out in faith, and it's in God's hands now. He works for those who wait for him. Would you write, would you would you reach out to a murderer? So, a, alleged murderer? Huh? Who who? I, I don't know, I'm not doing that. Well, how's God ever gonna move if he can't move through you? How's 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 the the man under the street going to get reached if you don't go under that bridge and reach out to him. I'm not saying go find a drunk. That's, that, that's getting the pump out. That's you making something happen. I'm saying if you get a vision of a drunk under 3rd Street Bridge, you better get your ass under there and reach out to that guy because God's got something big going to happen. And you get the spillover. You get to watch it. But you know what's happening? We're sitting on our asses absolutely doing nothing and saying, waiting for God to do everything. What? I, where, where did that come from? This, this is great stuff here, so I'm not saying. But I'm only, I'm only talking, <coughs> I'm sitting here thinking this. What you said is perfect. We need to seek God. So, I... 
maybe we could do it, maybe we would do it a little more if we just thought, I'm going to try to think about Jesus Christ as much as I possibly can every day, just spend my time thinking about him. Of course, thinking of the function. <laughs> but, and then, it's a little difficult in, with our with our conditioned minds being what they are from birth because we know what's good, we know what's nice. So if we're not careful, we'll be stepping out on our own. Exactly. That's the pump. Mm -hmm. So it's just But he's right. If we stay focused on Christ and our relationship with him. Don't focus on him just to hear something. Focus on him because he's Lord of all. He's your he's, he's everything to you. He's your savior. He's your father. Focus on him, love on him, and then out of that intimacy with him, you're going to hear him say things. Give this. Go do that. Go mow that person's grass. Go step out and say this to that person. You got a word, you feel if you see somebody and you feel like I just feel like I got a word for you. Well, say it. You know, I've had a word for them. And I said, come 10 minutes early. Well, Daniel couldn't be here, so they said, well, can we meet? And I'm like, yeah, I got nothing going on Saturday afternoon. Now, I'm driving thinking, well, I don't know if this is a word. It's, it's not earth-shaking, but it's, it came to me, so what am I going to do with it? Wow, that ain't God. That can't be God. It's just great here, you know. It's 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 it's, it's, it's Sierra sitting there. What God's not going to use me to speak to somebody. That's 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 all got to go. You what you whatever it is. Again, I would rather see you fail a million times and hit it one, because that one time you hit it, miracles are going to happen. Supernatural things are going to take place. Because when God shows up, that's all that can happen. He doesn't work just in natural things. He'll split a Red Sea. He makes manna come down from heaven. I mean, it takes a business doomed to fail, and because he pronounces the blessing on it, makes the business flourish. So, combination here. Hear God, but don't trust in yourself to make what you hear happen by pumping whether it's your finances, whether it's something personal in your life or something in somebody else's life. We got to start believing in the miraculous, in the supernatural, because that's the realm God moves and works out of. We limit ourselves, and we limit ourselves to to the world and how it operates. Minimum wage. You understand? That's the least they want to give you. It ain't the most they want to give you because they don't want to bless you. It is the very least that I can give you. And then we're going for your benefits if I can't cut that down. And Come on, man. You think I'm going to subject myself to those greedy, crony capitalists? I'm trusting in the Father who watches over my land beginning of the year to the end of the year. And I don't got to pump nothing. I wait on him and he provides everything. And just real quick, you sit there and think, well, look... I'm not saying you're going to be a millionaire, and I'm not going to say you're going to have three cars. I'm not. It, I don't think that's what. That's how you gauge riches. I'm saying you will have everything you need and more with what He's called you and where He's called you. It would be stupid to give me millions of dollars if I've got it. If, if, if where I'm at, cost of living ain't that high here that I need to be a millionaire. I don't have a business that I, that I need millions of dollars. I don't have a church of 20,000 people will I need, where I need millions of dollars. I'm not looking for a million. I wouldn't know what to do with it. Oh, yeah, spend it on myself. Right away, I'd upgrade the truck, get a better house, get rid of this building. And go, is, but is that what God's doing? No. So that's not how I'm gauging my riches. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory where I'm at, what he's called me to do. And the worst thing you can do right now is compare yourself with somebody else's riches and see yourself limited. 
Because Paul said, when you compare yourself to other people, you're foolish. You look to God and what he's doing. And be content with what he's given you. And you'll always have enough. And I will tell you, you may have bought an Ishmael. And it has to go. Because it's so sucking your finances. But that's the wisdom of God. Again, we pray for. How do I adjust? I had to adjust. When, when I went through divorce, I, had, I, I was no longer a two-income dude. I was reduced down to one income. And I'm like, okay, now I don't know how I'm going to live. I'm used to living on two incomes. How am I going to live on one? I had to start with wisdom. What, what, are you, what, are you, what are we changing here? Let's move some stuff around. Let's get rid of that. I don't need that. Like it, but don't need it. And move around and everything. And I lost pretty much everything. I had to start with new fur with old furniture given to me. I mean, I didn't get a lot out of that. But slowly, where God had me, what he called me into, what he called me to do, like he's calling you to do, what he's got you doing, he brings everything back. It's long, it, it doesn't come overnight, but it's faithfulness where you just keep waiting and waiting. It took Abraham 20 years to get that son. Don't give up on God because time is yelling at you, speaking to you, and creating doubt in you. I don't care how long. Stay faithful in trusting God. He always comes through. And, and it ain't over with yet. That's the thing. It's not over with yet. There's still more God wants to do in your life. But let me ask you this, and then I'm done. Let me ask you this, and this is a hard question. I'm not condemning. I'm not judging. It's an honest question that I should be able to ask any one of you guys. You want God to be in every affair of your life. And I get it. I do too. I want him in my finances. I want him in my marriage. I want him in my bank account. I want him in my health. I want him in my IQ. I want him. I want, I want success. I want abundance in every area of my life. I want him to be in every affair of my life. But let me ask you, how much are you involved in his affairs? Because the one thing I can't stand, and there are people out there, I know them personally. They're takers. All I, they're always taking from me. Take, 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 and they never offer anything back. Not that I want anything, but after a while, doesn't that get weary? It's like, this dude calls me three hours one day, two hours another day. And it's like, man, you go to another church, you tithe to another church, you give it, but you can't call that pastor, can you? Why, why are you always want me? And you, it doesn't make it, but I keep giving him everything that I know. Everything that I know. Everything that I know. But I gotta be honest with you. This has been going on since 2010. He's never been here. I, I gotta finish. Okay. I gotta finish. He's never been here. And that's okay. Except, what's wrong that you can't get that information from over there? There's takers out there. And if we and and, and they never ever, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Have you ever talked to somebody on the phone and it's all about them? And they never ask you how you're doing? And they're notorious for that? No, don't sit there and tell me you don't know people like that. So, and that's, and I'm not condemning or judging. I want to flip it around. Is that how we are with him? This is what we, God, I need this. God, I need that. And when I'm not asking, I'm bitching and complaining to him about what he's not doing. But how often do I say, what are you doing that's got nothing to do with me that I can do to help somebody else? What's the father's business today? You ever ask him what he's doing? No, because you're too consumed. We are narcissists, spiritual narcissists. And it's not just us. It's the, it's the majority of the body of Christ because it's our culture today. It's me, 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 me. And if it's all about you, how can he ever move through you when you keep making it about you? He can't move through you to somebody else because you keep making it about you. And I'm just as guilty. 
Every time he speaks something, I'm thinking, how's that good? Is that to me? He's like, come on. How about me saying something that doesn't have nothing to do with you, Greg? This is about that guy over there. This is what I, this is about that girl in jail. This is about, it's not about you. Okay, is it okay that I do something through you that won't be about you? And I'm like, God, I, we're, we're terrible. We're, we're terrible. terrible. We're testing God. So let's, let's put the kingdom first. Isn't that what he's, uh, maybe that's a scripture, Matthew 6, 3. Seek first the kingdom. See what the Father's doing. And while you're working for the Father and not for your business, not for where you work, though you do that, but primarily you're there for Him, so what are you doing? How about going to work and rather than complaining about how bad work is, say, Lord, what are you doing today at work with me that will have some kingdom to it, salt and light? Because that's why you're, you're primarily here for salt and light. And if you don't get that, you're a narcissist. Sorry, I'm just going to call you what you are. If you don't see yourself as salt and light, then when you go to work and you make it all about you, that's narcissism. How about going there saying, Lord, I, those people are idiots. I get that. But I'm there for a reason, to be salt and light. Maybe I'll have the idea that turns that place around. Maybe you can give that to me. Or maybe I'll walk in there and God says, this is your last day, quit you want to be able to do that? See, God, I'm telling you, God, that, that, then we're not people of faith if we can't act on what we hear. And that's why it's so imperative. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but step out in what you hear. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, it's not about us. We're, it, it, it's, it's not about us. And the only way we're going to be supernatural, or the only way you're going to be supernatural, is through us in other people's lives. And God, i got to be honest, this is not the direction I saw this message going in. I want to talk about that pump. But you did what you did. You spoke what you spoke. And... and, and, and Break up the fallow ground in our hearts that we can receive this seed sown, this word sown. We can be other, other people minded. We cannot be consumed with thoughts of ourselves 24 7. That's why God said in Galatians chapter 6, Paul said, Do not grow weary in well doing. Don't grow weary in being salt and light and help to other people. Because that's why you're here. That's why Paul could take the beating that he took and the lack that he experienced. Because it was for other people. It wasn't for him. It was never for him. He said, I, my, my body is a drink offering. I pour my life out for people. Do we do that? Is that our mode of operation? We're a drink offering. People are drinking from us all the time. Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Send me. That's what God's saying. Are you about my business? Or are you about pumping, pumping the riches yourself into your life? Or are you about me doing it through you? What are we about? Do we trust in Him? Do we hear in Him? Are we stepping out what we're hearing? Because He's able to do above and beyond what we can ask or think. Yes, you're going to have a blessed life. He tells us that. But I really believe while we are out there doing the Father's business, we are being taken care of. Seek first the kingdom, and all these things are added unto us. You make it about Him. He's, all, he's already making it about you. Lord, open the eyes of our understanding. Let us see how rich you are toward us. And in that richness, we become a blessing to other people. Out of our riches, 
we become a blessing to other people as salt and light. I want you to do something we I rarely do here. I want you to pray to yourself. I'm going to give you about two minutes as Zach plays. I want you to pray. What are you hearing? What's this message mean to you? And I want you to take this, this hour-long message, capitalize it into a two-minute prayer. Be responsible with this, this message today. To the Father today. Pray whatever you got out of this. Pray it to Him in the next two minutes. I did not see this message going in this direction, so we'll just receive it. And may the grace of God be with you all. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget to sow in the word this morning. We'll see you either Thursday night or next week.